crystals very beautiful <clears throat> and to grow the materials for the like neutron scattering to do other measurements so today we started from chemistry okay so i know a lot of students are solid state chemistry students and most of the students from the connect matters okay so when my collaborators in connect matters they came to me they always asked me the question is wait wait where did you learn this black magic <laughs> to make something from no database. Okay, <laughs> so today I will talk about this one. And I will use a lot of words called I feel. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I will not tell you that's exactly what's going on, but that's how I think. And I hope give you some inspiration or a different view to look at the materials. Okay, <clears throat> so, so, Okay, so what the difference between chemistry and physics? If we think about physics, physics always study, oh, we wanna see what happens to the fermion surface. But if you go to a chemistry lab and you only see elements, okay, and the furnaces, that's all. And the, you ask the chemistry students, a lot of students say, I love science. Why do you choose chemistry? They will say, I love science, but I don't wanna deal with math. So yeah, that's the same for me, okay? I like doing experiment, but I'm a little bit scared of a lot of equations. So that's why I try to interpret all these physical properties in a very detailed chemistry picture. And it will help me to understand these like phenomena, and then I can think about the, some materials to make. So for chemistry, the language chemistry use, Usually is we count the electrons, right? One, two, three, four, five. That's easy math, okay? <laughs> and we also study the crystal structure. Oh, it looks like this way, that way. And then we study chemical bonding, bonding, anti-bonding, non-bonding. That's what we like. And for chemists, what we um, focus on. So physics focus on to find a new physical uh, phenomena. But chemistry, our goal is to find new materials. And uh, what I usually do is I will tell my physics collaborator like JP, I say, hey, JP, I made this one. I feel it's very cool. And that's all. <laughs> so then JP said, okay, don't worry, we will study it. So I, my job is made it. And I tell him, okay, that's it. And uh, the physics job, kind of job is try to understand the material deeper. And I say, oh, this is a superconductor. What kind of properties it has? <laughs> okay. So, so let's get started. Actually, I would say this is the most important page for all my talk. That's all my inspiration coming from. Um, when I was a student, I read these two professors' paper. One is Professor Rob Hoffman. I think the uh, most of the chemistry students know he 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 is at Cornell. He got the Nobel Prize. And the other professor, I think most of the students didn't know him very well. Actually, he passed away in 1997, but, but I read his paper, Jeremy Burdett, I read his paper a lot. And then Professor Ron Hoffman, Professor Jeremy Burdett, I always go back to read their works and then I get some inspirations and then I go back to do it. So today I will focus on some of the work they, they talk about many, many years ago, like 30 years ago, 20 years ago, and then how it connected with nowadays quantum materials. Okay, so one of the work is actually JP and the next work. So, so and, and today I want students to learn, oh, sorry. Okay. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. And today we'll focus on learning three things. Okay, the first one is we learn a term called a hypervalent bonding picture okay so we'll go through micro it's a class 
The second one, we will learn how to use the structure feature connections to find the new materials. And the third one is we learn a little bit about the high pressure synthesis and high pressure method to explore the new compounds. Okay, so, so basically I want to talk about how I think, not the detailed techniques. So if you have the detailed techniques question, you can ask me later, but I want to tell you how I think about this. Uh, how do we find the black magic compounds? So the hypervalent um, compounds, so we call it a hypervalent bonding is um, Professor Rob Hoffman, okay, in 2000, actually another professor, he's the professor at the University of Maryland. Okay, so Professor Rob Hoffman in 2000, he has an idea about, about it, uh, to understand the materials. And then he said all the materials, not all the materials, most of the materials, we can try to study their bonding. And then we can interpret if the bonding is very stable or not very stable. Okay, so for me, like for quantum material students, and I think a trick, okay, I feel, again, that I feel, if you see some compounds, they can, you can make it, but they show unstable electronic structure. Usually this kind of compound will show some interesting properties to balance this unstable electronic structure, okay? So for example, if you saw some unstable electronic structure, you could see the charge density wave, you could see the magnetic ordering or even the superconductivities. So that's what I feel. And then in this paper, what the professor Rob Hoffman said is, if you look at a hypervalent geometry, this geometry, so, okay, we consider this one as unstable electronic structure. If we want to make it a relatively stable electronic structure, we can have one way. One is lower down the geometry, so reduce the uh, dimension. So we make it from the higher dimension to lower dimension, and it will become more stable. Or if we want to keep the same dimension, and then we need to oxidize. oxidize. So we need either add electrons or like uh, this one go to here is reduce electrons to make it stable. Okay, so that's the chemistry term, right? Oxidation reduction. So here I give you an example. That's the, a lot of students may be very familiar with. That's the square antimony minus this, the planetary uh, uh, framework. Okay. So here we take the antimony for, uh, as an example, but we know here is the periodic table. Arsenic bismuth it usually works, especially coming to the topological materials. Actually, people like bismuth better because it's heavy. Okay. So, so this, if you look at the square net, if you look at the square net, that's a two-dimensional. And then in these compounds, the antimony arsenic bismuth, these compounds, they the atoms, they always show the minus one. And they like to be oxidized, it becomes the antimony zero net that they connected with three. Okay. Or they can have reduced that dimension. They make the, the planetary square go to one cube, one cube, one cube, or become the zigzag or become the ladders. Okay. So, so if you are interested, you can read this paper. It's a very long paper. So I try to explain it. And here, let's take the antimony again, take antimony, for example. Okay, so here, and antimony again, look at this antimony. So antimony has, so let's look, if we want to make antimony, this atom stable, how many uh, uh, electrons does it need to make it? It has the eight electrons surrounding it. So antimony needs to have three minus, right? Okay, so this is the antimony. So if we want to make it stable, and if we try to make antimony two minus, so that's to say, if you want to make it, if you just borrow two electrons from the outside, then you have one electron, it's not paired. So now it's not stable. If you want to pair, you can form uh, antimony-antimony dimer. 
Now each antimony will be the two minus, but it's still stable. Okay. So if you want to make the antimony one minus, you have to make the double bond. Or each antimony have two single bond connected with something else. So this is the the pictures about like the ideas. If you have some compound, you don't know what the oxidation states, and and you feel oh the oxidation states is a little bit weird. You may consider there is some chemical bonding formed between the atoms and the atoms. Okay, so here we take example. For example, European antimony two, and in this compound, and let me ask you what usually European what's the oxidation states in the metallics about European? Italy is like a two plus, right, or three plus. But antimony itself, it's already if you want to stabilize it, it cannot be three minus. So then you check the, the connections, the bonding interactions. Okay, you find out antimony and antimony, they form some bond together. And in this kind of framework, it's called the hypervalent bonding. Okay. And then, so for the European antimony too, it shows the two plus. And if you go to the ytterbium SB2, so you will see in this system, the antimony has the zigzag as well as the square. So that means one antimony is zigzag, like the European zigzag minus, and the other one will be the square minus. Okay. And then we come into the scenario antimony too. That's Professor Julia Chen yesterday talked about the compound she made in her group. And you can see in this compound that the antimony has antimony antimony dimer and as well as the square. Okay. So, so this kind of compound, we call it the hypervalent, uh, hypervalent bonding in the system. Usually, okay, I'm not saying always. Usually, if you saw the material like this one, you pay more attention because this kind of compounds, this zigzags, these plants, they are a compromise of the unstable electronic structures. And if we can make the, uh, if we want to test how unstable the electronic structure is, usually they give us very interesting, like the materials, like topologic, magnetic, charge density waves, and so on. So, hey, yeah. mm. So hypervalent compounds, are they typically metallic or typically more localized or, or in your experience? So I think usually, okay, usually it's like the semi-metal, semiconductor, because so this is um, usually is for the compound if we have a very strong electron positive and a very strong electron negative, we don't need this picture. It's just I do electron, we take the electron, that's the deal. But it happens to the materials, the compounds, the elements is I'm not that strong, you are not that weak. So let's make a compromise. So you make a frame. And I also give you a certain level of the electron. And then let's make a compromise. Okay, so that's why there are a lot of interesting um, physical properties. It can be induced by, for example, pressing. And because like, okay, we are just in a very weird balance. Now a little bit of precipitations will make some change. Okay, so also in this paper. Okay, <laughs> so this is JP and the next work. So <clears throat> the, Okay, in this paper, this is show. So uh, Professor Ron Hoffman is basically talking about uranium terrorium G. So, and this is the question he asked in the paper. Now we can work on it together. What's the oxidation state of the uranium in this compound? So we have one uranium. You see the black dot, that's the uranium. And then we have two types of the terrorium. One is the isolated terrorium and one is the plant terrorium. Okay. So if we look at the uranium, the normal oxidation state of uranium is four plus, right? Four plus, okay, here. It's here. Okay, it's usually it's four plus. And however, if you have isolated a terrarium, terrarium is just below the oxygen, right? So below oxygen, oxygen usually have two minus. So if it's isolated the terrarium, it's usually it's two minus. And however, the other terrarium in the plant is supposed to be two minus if your uranium is four plus. But I have a bonding between each other. So this terrarium shouldn't be just the two minus. So they must share some electrons between each other. So in this system, 
uranium thorium too. We can interpret one thorium, okay, you are two minus, but the other thorium, it's like between one minus and two minus. And then uranium, it could be between the three plus and four plus. And uh, okay, so in his paper, he was indicate there may be some interesting properties happens. So then you guys find this very interesting superconductivity at the low temperature. Okay, so wait, wait. Yeah. Are you saying that Bachman has a paper on this? Yes. Really? Yeah, in 2000. Really? Yes. So that's why I strongly, I strongly recommend you guys to read this paper because there are so many other interesting compounds. For example, this one, copper, uranium, two, thorium, six. Okay. <laughs> and this copper can be replaced by potassium, cerium. Okay. And then you can study again what's the oxidation state of the thorium. So copper, if copper is one plus, usually copper is one plus in the metallics. And then uranium will be four plus, and then thorium six. And three of them is two minus, and three of them will be one minus, but it's like between one minus and two minus. Again, which made the uranium is between three plus and four plus. Okay. Maybe we should press this one or study this one. Okay. So, so, okay, so this is for students was like, if you wanted to study some compounds and usually, so that's what I teach my students. You check the database, okay? And the first things you want to study is not just to study the structure. Let's look at the banner structure, okay? So this is the website, you can check that banner structure. So my students will say, oh, I don't understand band structure. But if you look at band structure, it is a gap or small gap or pseudo gap. So that usually means the compound has the chemical balance, right? So it's the charge of the anion equals the charge of the uh, cation. Okay, so then you need to figure out where is the cation and where is the anion. And then it will help you to understand these materials from the chemistry way very well. So it will say, oh, so just like what do we talk about? If we look at the uranium thorium too, you could go back to check the band structure approximately, what kind of property it is, how much electrons it left around the Fermi, Fermi level. And then you can predict if this is like the, okay, supposed to be the track balance or not. Okay. And then the next thing is check the chemical bondings between the main group elements. So here in chemistry, we call this bond. So did you see the boundary, the black one? We call this boundary called the lintel boundary. Okay, the lintel boundary means from this side, elements on this side, they can form the bonding. Just like what I said, the antimony, antimony form a bond and the thorium, thorium form bond suffer and the selenium, arsenic and a gallium, okay? So, however, aluminum cannot because it's so electron positive and it doesn't have enough like D orbitals to fill the extra, uh, to, to put the extra electrons. And the indium, so some of the team can do that, but a lot of team cannot do that. And the lead cannot, but a slightly bitumen can do that. So you could consider this one. So let's do an example, okay? So, so if you can write down compounds, strontium, manganese, for example, antimony 2. Let's take this one as an example of bismuth 2. I think this is what people study a lot for the wire semi-metal. Okay, so, so as what I said, the first things you guys need to do is go to the website to check the band structure and it tells you this is a semi-metal, okay? And then you can, I can ask you, what's the oxidation state of the strontium usually it is? So here, strontium is here. What's the oxidation of the strontium is? Two plus, right? So what's the manganese here it is? Mn. Also, usually it shows the two plus because they have the D5 half-filled electrons, right? Orbitals. So the strontium is two plus and magnesium is two plus. And how about bismuth two? Okay, so now you say, oh, usually bismuth shows the string minus. But if two of them are all string minus, then it's not charge balanced. 
So we go back to look at the compounds. So here, what I show is barium. Okay, barium antimony manganese or something. So then we find out there is a, this is the square net. Okay, the square net of the bismuth or antimony or arsenic. And then this square net, just like what I said, each one connected with another one, another two. So the square net for this one is the bismuth. It shows all the antimony. It shows the minus. So then another one is the isolated one. So one bismuth is three minus, okay? And one is just a minus. So that's the two type of the bismuth, okay? And now, for example, the reason why I write this one is A, M, N, like P, N, 2. So this is how we can find the new materials is if there is a report, that they made the strontium manganese bismuth too. And then the easy, the easy way for you to find the new material is we can replace the strontium, right? So we can, we can replace the strontium with calcium, barium, or an European and terbium. So then that's fine, okay? And we can replace the bismuth with antimony, with arsenic. Okay, sometimes possible, but not very often. And then we can make a group compounds, a family, okay? So that's one way. And the other way is we can say, okay, if I said, um, I don't like the manganese, I want to replace the manganese, I want to kill the magnetism of the manganese. Or I said, I want to study the rare earth magnetic. So how about can we change the A into the rare earth? So if we change the A into the rare earth, that means we have to change it from the two plus to three plus, right? So then we need to reduce, okay? So from the two plus manganese to the one plus copper. So that's a new group of compounds again. So this is the compounds, the rare earth, for example, here, this is the work I did in 2015. So rare earth, gold, bismuth. And if you think this gold is too heavy, you can go up to like the silver copper, but you know, silver, silver is very eternal, right? So it, you cannot control where the electric uh, atoms is. So you can go to copper, go to gold. So that's a plus, okay. So that's the simple way we can do this one. And do you have any questions about this part? Yeah. So in general, hyper hyperbalan bonding yes. is an indication of an unstable electronic structure that may need to <laughs> Yes. Is there a way of like, like is hyperbaton bonding weaker than any other type of bonding and that's why this is unstable or why it Oh, yes, yeah, so usually, okay, here I didn't go deeper for this part. If you read that paper, you could see that this hyper, uh, this is like the hyperbaton bonding usually indicated the electronic, the, they, have the, they have formed the bonding, for example, here, so the electrons on the business, this plan, they usually form a big high bonding of, yeah. So then that's not very stable or like we call it not stable. We just say, okay, this is very um, like a, they're there. So it may be interesting, but just like what I said, I feel it could be not very stable. Yeah. And, uh, but, but we, we don't know until we made it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so this is like a, so that's like a one way. If you look at a semiconductor, semi-metal, that's the one thing you need to think about. If you can find this kind of the structural features, like the square, the square plans, all this stuff. And then the other interesting compound, so we would say like it's coming from here is, so except the charge balance, so you have the equal anion, with the, like the cation. So the charge of the anion equals the charge of the cation. And then there are some compounds, okay? Just like what I said, if you have sodium with chlorine, you have no doubt the sodium will give electrons to chlorine. But then if you come into here and this one to here, so the elements from the left side is less electron positive. The elements from the right side is the less electron negative. And then it's keep compromised. It's not straightforward anymore. It compromised, but we still find a lot of semiconductors, semi-metals between these elements. And then we want to understand 
if there is any rules behind it. So this is another compound. If we compare with the previous one, is we we have this barrier layer and then the magnesium antimony layer and then uh, antimony layer. So now one thing we can do is we can take away, completely take away this barrier layer. Okay, so what we have here is one, one, two. If we take one layer, go away, it will become one, one, one. So that's also another very famous compound, this one, one, one compound. Again, you can find this reference like uh, Professor Lo Hoffman published it in 1985 or something. So he already predicted this is very interesting. So for example, here we have the rare earths, like we take the serum, for example, antimony, thorium, this is one on one. So serum and the thorium will become here, and then antimony will become another layer. Okay. So then as we keep going, getting closer and closer, we figure out that group of compounds we cannot use. You are two plus and three minus this kind of charge to explain the stability. So what we are doing another way is we try to explain it, use the electron counting rules, okay? So, so this is like a, one of the very famous one is the half poisoner compound, because half poisoner compound has thousand half poisoner compound. And if you want to make half poisoner half poisoner compound, a semi-metal semiconductor, it's very easy. So I tell my students is, you pick up one from the right, you pick up one of left, right, and middle. Okay, so you pick up one, this part, another part, and in the middle, and then count the balance electrons of the total. If it's 18, you definitely could make it. Okay, so we can take an example, we pick up anyone. So let's just say, okay, lutetium. So here, lutetium. So the balance electrons of biolutetium. So it doesn't include the F electron. So that's the three, right? And the platinum PT. PT, where is the PT? Okay, not here, I'm oh, sorry. So the balance electron is 10. And the bismuth is five, so it's 18. So you go to the lab, make it, you definitely they could have made it. Okay, so because in general, what they're going to do is now they have another deal. So the previous deal is you give me electron, okay, one person, I cannot handle all this one, so I share with my colleagues, right? So it's like, okay, if JP said, oh, wait, wait, this is given to you. I said, oh, that's too much. So Julia, can you share with me? So now Julia and I, we form a bond. That's it. So that's the interphase phase hyperbalance. So now if like three of us, we say, oh, so who gave who electrons? It's hard to tell. How about this one? We three make a phone together. We fill the gap, we fill the orbitals. So the 18 electrons is a very common uh, electron counting we always see. So if you, you see a compound is a semi-metal and then you couldn't assign the oxidation states. So can you assign the oxidation states for this one? No, you can't, right? Lutetium is three plus, bismuth is three minus. And how about PT? Zero. So I'm there just because everybody ignoring me. <laughs> right, so you must have some electrons like a, like a you give and because otherwise compounds cannot exist, right? Because we are interact. Anyway, you should take some of my electrons. I give you some electrons. Otherwise, we cannot form the compound. So, so this is the deal. So they said, how about this one? We make this like the fill the orbitals. So they fill the orbitals. They fill the one s orbitals, three p and five d. All these orbitals. And then they make it a stable compound. So 18 electrons counting is very common. But nowadays, just like what I said, people also like to find if there is like a 12 electron counting. And uh, because if, so just the, the same thing. I always tell my students, <laughs> OK, why everybody should be equal? Because electron even knows everything is equal. Orbitals knows everything is equal, OK? So the same thing, if you are the electron or the orbitals, you will ask why we have to fill up 1s, 3p, and 5p. Why not we fill up 1s, 1p, 5p? Why not we fill up 1s, 2p, 4d, and so on? So yeah, it could be. Theoretically, yes. So we need to find more data to fill up that one theory. So one is the 14 electrons. So this is. <laughs> Okay, this is the work I did when I was just to become a system professor. So again, 
what I did is I looked at the, uh, the, the compounds molybdenum silica 2, chromium silica 2. So molybdenum silica 2, chromium silica 2, both of them are semi metal, okay, a semiconductor. So, but molybdenum is here, chromium is here, and the silica is there. So, let me ask you if it's like the semiconductor, that means there is the valence bond and the conduction bond that separate. So they, then if you use the semi-metal, the chemistry uh, charge balance argument, what's the oxidation state of the molybdenum? Uh, what's the oxidation state of the silica in this compound? And we don't know, right? Silica usually form the four minors, but the molybdenum could be eight plus, that's impossible, right? So, so if we study the band structure and we figure out for molybdenum silica and chromium silica, what we are need to do is we need to fill up seven orbitals. So then there will be a big gap. And this seven orbital total has the valence electron that's 14. Okay, so that's the one S1 P5B. So this is the new compound rhenium gallium silic. That's that's what we're coming from here. So my idea is very simple. If molybdenum is here and the rhenium is here, right? And then how about this one? Is I Oh, okay, I cannot work on the, this TC, it's radioactive. So I say, okay, rhenium is here. I have one more electrons than molybdenum. And then silica, okay, silica is here. If we, I reduce one electron, go to the gallium. Can I make the same structure? Also a semiconductor. Okay, that would be a new compound. So then what I did is just to put the rhenium silica together, Okay, we also put the rhenium aluminum silic together. So this is the compound we make, rhenium gallium silic. And then one gallium go to the silic side, fully occupied, very ordered, no disorder. And this is the semiconductor. And you can see it's also filled the gap here. Okay, that's a new compound, a new semiconductor. Okay, so. So another interesting thing we thought about is, if it's a semiconductor, can we move this, the Fermi level a little bit up or down to make it a superconductor? So that's another thing we did is, we tried to dope, but the gallium is not working, but we find out for aluminum one is, we put a little bit more aluminum. So now it's off the 14 electron, right? So it's off the 14 electron, it's below the 14 electron. So there's the electrons around the Fermi level, and we find out it's a superconductor. So we're tuning from the semiconductor to superconductor, just tuning that electron contents. Okay. So usually, if you just started to do research, I always suggest my students, okay, let's work in from the semiconductor because making compound, like you cannot predict superconductor, but we can really predict if it's a semiconductor or semi-metal, if it's a new semiconductor, then semi-metal. So that's the one thing I hope you could remember every time when you saw compounds and bring up your fingers, count the electrons, I would say that's like you are getting to know the chemistry. <laughs> okay. So, so just like what I said, we chemistry, we like to study the electron counting and we like to study the structure. Okay. Cause, cause we cannot understand, no, we cannot. It's just we are, well, for me, okay, I, I cannot represent everything. For me, I feel it's so hard to understand so many equations. Let me find some like, a, like a common rules. So the common rules is if you look at the materials with, they show the interesting property. This materials always runs in family. This property is always run in family. So like the, like the cuprate, like the iron arsenic superconductor, if the barium iron two arsenic two is a superconductor, highly possible strontium iron two arsenic two is also a superconductor. So they run in family. So, in, so, so, so this is like a, a compound. I think most of the students are very familiar. That's the perovskite structure. So the perovskite A B so M T O three, right? Okay. So then, for example. <laughs> So the potassium dope, the barium, bismuth, oxygen three. This is a superconductor. The TC is thirty Kelvin, and uh, so this is the perovskite structure. And then later, people find out that the anti-perovskite structure 
They also show some superconductivity. For example, the magnesium carbon nickel three. This is also, so you can see it has the like 60% of the nickel in the system. So the blue atom is the nickel and the green is the magnesium and the inside it is the carbon. So this is completely opposite, right? So we call it the anti proskite structure. And the strontium, the strontium-3, tin, oxygen, this is also anti proskite structure. And both of them are superconductor. So for me, okay, I'm an intermetallic person and one of my favorite compounds is heavy fermion superconductor. That like the, one of the representative work is the cerium hope indium fly. Again, I'm sorry. Again, so from the chemistry, um, okay, for as, okay. As a chemist, so as a chemist, I, I know like a JP and Nick, they study a lot about heavy fermion superconductor. And then they say, oh, this one, heavy fermion, you need to fit this one, fit that one for me. Oh, oh too much, don't talk with me that. <laughs> So, so I would just say, oh, this is interesting because I, I will always tell my physics collaborator is, okay, can you just tell me in one sentence about the material? They say, oh, okay. So you can consider this one as the combination of the magnetism and the superconductivity. And I would feel, oh, that's very cool because we know the magnetism always can kill the superconductivity. So, so if a material, it can host the magnetism and the superconductivity together, that would be very cool. And on the other side, I will asking myself is, so what I see, okay, I know I have a lot of imagination when I think about materials. I was thinking about this heavy chromium is, there is a house. Okay, so I always say, I always say the, the magnetism is like the hurricane, okay? And then, so, the magnetism comes, the superconductivity like the house will be completely destroyed. So however, that the house hosted the superconductivity, when hurricane come, it can still stay there. How special the structure is, right? So we just study the structure. <laughs> so that's, that, that's my, my imagination. So then I look at these compounds. If we look at this one, cerium is the yellow atom. And the cobalt is the, the green one. And the indium is the green one plus the orange one. So they have one more five structure. It's very simple. In total, it only has seven atoms. So that's a very good model. And when I check the database, the, there's a compound that comes to my mind. It's the magnesium arsenic platinum five. They have the same space group. Okay, same space group. And if we go to look at this compound, you will see the platinum, okay, not completely, but but you see the platinum is the transition metal, and the here transition metal is cobalt, and arsenic is main group elements, the indium is the main group elements. So we call it anti 115 structure type. Okay, so so then the first things we try to see if we can see the superconductivity, just to use the like the non real earth one, the magnesium arsenic platinum five. And we didn't see the superconductivity above the 1.8 Kelvin. And then, okay, so this is my lab. I couldn't, okay, my lab didn't grow the fancy crystals like Julius did or like the professor brain cells they did. So my lab is very simple. I always tell my students, fast, okay? So you don't need to grow the big crystal. I just wanna see the face if it exists or not, because I'm curious. I want to know the result immediately. <laughs> so we usually press it into a pallet and then we sell it into the furnaces. And we usually, so this one is we try to grow in the crystal. That's what we find out later. This is the best way to grow the small crystals, like relatively beautiful crystals. But usually we just quench it. I want to see if the face exists or not. Okay, so the first thing is we are not we are not hurry to go to the rare earth first because rare earth is relatively big compared to the magnesium. So we go to the manganese first because manganese always shows the two plus. Magnesium is two plus. So we say okay, let's test the manganese, and then we find out 
Yes, the manganese, the transition metal can form this phase exactly the phase, and then we can do this like characterization. Okay, and we find out it's not superconductor, instead, it's a ferromagnetic materials. And uh, so that's what we found. And also another thing like about the one five is we think it's interesting. It's also not just a we think, it's a lot of people agree that because it's so sensitive to the pressure, chemical pressure, physical pressure. So what we did is we see tested the phosphorus, if this place exists, and we find it is exist, and then we find the okay. Here I want to say a lot of time I have no patience because I just do the things very quickly. And, and here, okay, so here, I think Tyler is here, the Professor Campus, uh, from Professor Campus group from the AIMS lab. Okay, so they grow the, yes, so they grow the material, the big crystals. They grow very beautiful big crystals. They're expert to do that. And then they find out my result is not correct. So see, sometimes growth crystal is very important to interpret the properties. Okay, so I really appreciate they did that one. So we continue to do this work. Mm. What did they find that was not correct? Right. Oh, I think they told me here. See, there's some residual here. It's coming from the impurity. You mean the ferromagnetism? No. Oh. Yeah, yeah, it's ferromagnetism. It's coming from the oh, it's, Yeah, it's not ferromagnetism. It's anti yeah. mm. So that's anti. So then. Then what I was thinking is, okay, now it's come to the chemistry picture. We really need to study what's going on with the, like the bondings and so on. We find out this system, we can tune the magnetism. Okay, we can tune the magnetism, but no matter how we tune it, we couldn't tune to the superconductivity. Okay, so then we said, okay, um, we should uh, focus on the superconductivity. So we go back to the reverse. What? A type? It's an A type. This one? Yeah, the one that we discussed on the This one, right? Yes, yes. So that, yes. Oh, five minutes, okay. So then we find out, okay, so we use the red earth to do it. So we find out, we show the superconductivity signal, okay? So we are very happy. Okay, so because we have five minutes. So let's go to another one that's also inspired by Ron Hoffman, the frustrated magnetic lattice. So in 1919, and Professor Ron Hoffman studied the Kagumi lattice net. So this is very inspiring. And the most inspiring part is, so he said, okay, we, maybe we could consider the lattice space with the Kagumi lattice. So when I read that one, I said, oh, that's very cool. So, so, Nowadays, people work on the sodium ecarbonate selenium too a lot, which has the perfect triangular lattice. So then, however, because I was curious, um, so we did the lithium one, and then we also do the potassium one, and the, and the serum one, the medium one, and we find out we change the lattice a little bit. So because the lithium, you see, the lithium, sodium, potassium, the size, it keeps growing. And we find that the structure changed so big. Okay, so then I was thinking, oh, this system may be very sensitive to pressure. So, but in the beginning, we made a new phase that the lithium ecarbium selenium tube. This is the crystal we grow. This is, has the similar structure to the pyrochloric lattice, but it's also completely different from the pyrochloric lattice. So we call it a new pyrochloric lattice. And we see it's the non magnetic ordering. And down to the point zero seven Kelvin, and uh, and then we, because this is like and also we didn't see the magnetic and isotropic in the ecarbium in the parapyrite lattice, so we think it's very interesting. So I convinced my friends. I said, can you press it? I want to see if we can make it a superconductor. If we can make this quantum spin liquid candidates into superconductor, that would be very cool. So they press it for us up to the ninety five GPA. <laughs> So they, did, so they did this fast. Okay, in the beginning, I was working with Professor Kenfield. I said, can you press that for us? So he's postdoc pressed to like 55. Uh, yeah, and then he said, we didn't see any 
uh, insulating to the metal condition, but there is a trend. So then I said, okay, let's work with the, my collaborator in the IOP in China. So, so mm -hmm. no, it's Jing Guang. He's young, he's like my age. Yeah, he's my age. So then I ship the sample to them. They study overnight immediately. <laughs> okay, anyway. <laughs> so, okay, sorry, again. So then they find out, so they measure, they say, okay, we try our best. We measure to almost 100 GPA. But, and the good news is they saw the insulator to the metal transition, but the bad news is they did some signal things to the superconductivity and then the diamond was broken. So, so now they're still working. Okay, so the last the five, three minutes I was talking about the high pressure. Again, so we, we think like for me, I think the high pressure is very interesting because, okay, so we do several things. We do the diamond cell study and then we study the structures. Again, the interesting things about the synthesis part. Okay, I will just jump to the synthesis about high pressure synthesis. Why I think high pressure synthesis is very interesting is if you try to read the compound, okay. So for example, just like what I said, if a person made the strontium manganese bismuth too, and now you place replace the manganese use the antimony, and you made something similar. So are you surprised? You're not surprised. It's new, but for me, I feel that that's not challenging enough, okay. For chemistry, okay, if physics can do it, we have no advantage, we should do something physics couldn't do. Because physics already know much more equation than chemistry. So what do we, what I think the, the high pressure synthesis is very cool is because, okay, you can think about this is volume, this is the pressure, okay? So if you press the material, the starting material volume usually is V1. And then you press it, press it, okay, to here, right? And then what we are doing high pressure synthesis is we heat it up. So we wanna see what happens. So we heat it up and then we release the pressure. So now usually it will go back, 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 back. But you are very, we are very sure is the, the volume we got after pressurizing and heat up, usually it's smaller than we want, right? And then I figured out it's so hard to solve the crystal structure about the high pressure because you really need to get the single crystal and then do the X-ray diffraction and then you can solve the structure. It's because the material we are dealing with are always called condensed matter. The atoms already like packed closely to each other. So now you want to reduce the volume. So how they, can they coordinate? It's completely different from the ambient pressure phase. And it's so cool. <laughs> so I like it. So that's what we are doing. For example, we made this but honeycomb structure compounds. We make the European but together, make it a but honeycomb. And this is the recent work we did. We find a new phase, non citrus metric strontium to iridium uh, iridates in the system. And we find out this is the non citrus metric. Okay. So if we look at, because the strontium to iridium O4, this formula is similar to the lanthanum to copper O4. And it's very similar to the high, high TC superconductor. And if we look at this high TC superconductor and you see the octahedral, this is the octahedral. And the ambient pressure one strontium to iridium O4, this is the octahedral, they rotate a little bit. And this is what we got on the high pressure. We press it and release the pressure. So the octahedral now, there's no rotation. However, we find out, okay, so the octahedral <coughs> is not, so this like up, down, this like two handle is not equal, but here it's kind of equal. So that's still a little bit different from the corporates, but we are still working on this one. And this one we are, so the child should help us to, yes, thank you. Okay, so, <laughs> so, she, so she helped us to work on the, because um, the structure determination is quite hard. So they're working on the synchrotron. They get the intensity beam, help us to determine the right to the unit cell. What is non-centric symmetric? So, okay, so yeah, this is the strontium to iridium O4. This one is non-centric symmetric. Okay. 
Yeah. So, so, so that's like we think it's very cool. Yeah. And uh, and yeah, pressurize it. You will see something new. Okay. And uh, any question? Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I was thinking a uh, uh, lot about uh, money flow structures. If you go back to that structure, uh, a whole time. Yes. Yes. So, so what's going on here is there some like uh, phase transformation? Uh, I, I just understand like structure that you have to be released with pressure. Yes. Yes. So what happened is this is what we made before pressure. It's a layered compound, and the European they just being the layer. Okay, it's a plan. And after we pressurize and heat up, and after we release, release the pressure, and then this European their bonding is much closer, and they are like become this the but but so they get much closer to each other. Oh, I see. Yes. So the structure that you showed at the bottom is, is not the structure after uh, that the European structure or so this part, right? Yeah. Yes, that's the European one. Now the bonding between European and European is much shorter. But here before the press it, they, they, they don't have bonding interactions with it, with each other. I see. Yeah, so that distance is much shorter. Yeah. So, uh, can you go back to the slide with you on uh, the Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, what was the process here? It's like this time, what is the logic? Okay, because um, if we are getting the exactly the one 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 ratio, that's a semiconductor. So the Fermi level is at semiconductor, uh, the gap. So then we were thinking, can we move the Fermi level up or down? So then we will have electrons there. And usually the gap is like the, the peak shape is very like the sharp. And there is the, so this like two gaps, there is a flat band. So what we think is, can we push down to the flat band? And then we see, because who knows what will happen. Maybe it's not super conductive, maybe it's charge density width. But I want to hit the flat band. So that's my logic. So we need to go to the flat band? Yes. Yes. So we go to the, like we, like between the electrons go to the flat band. Yeah. 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 So I just want to ask you now, Press for example, and the bonding is now closer. Does that change the way the electrons are shared, or does that not change it? No. It changed the electrons. Uh, no, the electron total number of the electrons it's still the same, but now they need to really rearrange it. So that's why we think it's very cool. Yeah. Uh, this hypervalent bonding mixture. Uh, picture uh, does it also uh, you see weird things in there if uh, you have uh, a rare earth or uranium is mixed intermediate valence? Yeah, I uh, uh, wondering like you look at a crystal structure. Hmm, the uranium can't really be four plus. Yes, there. yes. So that one, yeah, that's what I said. So oh, uranium couldn't just be the single four plus. Right. It must be something else. So who knows? That's just many. Yeah. Um, so with the, with the one one twos, um, I know mm -hmm. some of them. I think with the like, strontium calcium barium, mm -hmm. they're like the net. I think the sorts they're actually orthorhombic. Yes. Right. Is that still uh, hypervalent, or is it like a hypervalent chain then, or should I think of that as like now being a series of diamonds? Yes. It actually it reduced the dimensions. Yeah. Yeah, it reduced. It. So it's going down to be not the hypervalent. Okay. Yeah. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. 
Um, you said something when you were uh, talking about the, the uh, noble metals between copper, silver, and gold. You said silver was weird for some reason. Do you know like why that is? Like, oh, yeah. Okay, so silver is very, actually the whole group are very eternal, right? And uh, like when we do the synthesis, you, uh, it, so for example, um, when you do the interclay, right? So usually people use lithium to do the interclay because they are very interrelated, it's running very smoothly, just like the lithium battery. But for solid state chemistry, uh, we don't like lithium that much, okay? I'm not a battery person. The reason is because lithium is so light and it's so eternate, our x-ray cannot find it. If you couldn't see it by x-ray, we cannot prove it, right? So what's the good candidate? That's the copper, this group, because they have the similar uh, properties like the lithium. It's always like, so if you look at the band structure, the, yeah, the band structure of the copper, it's just like this way. It's like the three electron models. Yeah. And then the silver is more weird because it's so eternal, right? You cannot see it from the x-ray clearly, but it always be everywhere. That's my experience. Yeah. yeah. Well, but just to follow up, so you're saying silver is usually plus? One plus. It's not as free like no, it's always one plus. So, I'm sorry, one plus. Yes. Yeah. So on that same question, because we touched <laughs> on uh, well, bismuth and gold, but yeah. you know, uh, bismuth and gold are both so-called valence skipper. So do you have a similar explanation for why bismuth is never two plus or gold is never two plus? Uh, so gold is very weird because another reason I like gold, but I don't like gold is don't like gold is because it's so expensive, so I cannot afford to use it. But I love gold is because gold is the most electron negative element uh, for the most not element, most electron negative metal. So so I always try to find a superconductor if that's a gold plus and gold minus the competing. So like for example the. The indium superconductor could be indium one plus with indium three plus compete. And the bismuth, like the barium bismuth oxygen three, I feel, okay, again, I feel, I have my own way to look at the material. I feel, oh yeah, so this is, has the uh, three plus, five plus. So the mixture, and then usually we, if we can suppress the charge density wave from this like a like two balance, and then we can see the superconductivity. For the gold, it's the same. I was thinking, I always try to, when I, if I work with you, I would say, hey, work on gold because maybe you have money. Because, so then the gold, I would say, can we make it a one plus and one minus? So this is the reason I work on it. But yeah, so it cannot, it's not cannot be two plus, but I think it's very hard to be two plus because like taking another electron is so hard. Uh, can you go back to this slide where you had one two two compound, europium, magnesium, uh, bismuth two? One two two compound. Yeah. Uh, well, one two or one two two. One two two, I think. Okay, europium, magnesium, bismuth. Right? Okay, yeah. So I will just go this way. Yeah. So, uh, how are these cells uh, sample cell size and what properties have you measured for the sample? Okay. So, okay. So, this one is what we are doing. Um, our in general goal is we try to make it a single crystal on a high pressure because if you made a new compound, it's a powder. Um, on high pressure, when you solve the crystal structure, it's very hard. So this is the single crystal we made, actually. So what we did is we put the sample here. We put sample, we made it the one, 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 two, two, but it doesn't matter. It just mix them together, okay? Because European is very easy oxidized. You don't want them. They're oxidized. You just make the sure you have the right ratio. And then we put into the, directly put into the crucible, so in the beginning, we use some wrap, but turns out it's terrible. So then we put into the insulator, magnesium, oxygen, this cube. And then we use the steel to heat it. And we put all this every cube into, the, into here. And then we press it. 
We usually test the different temperature, but we find out if we go to 800 degrees Celsius, we can make single protein. Yeah, so that's how we made it. Did you measure any properties? Oh, yeah, we just made the magnetic property, right? And then we measured, yeah, we saw the two conditions at low temperature. And uh, yeah, so that's what we observed. Any final final question? Yeah. Uh, do you do synthesis of new material under high pressure? Uh, and then I can follow up question here. Uh, so what do you do, you do uh, uh, synthesis of new material under high pressure? Or do you only do uh, do you only do uh, pressure on the already yeah. existing material? So okay, so we do two things. So the easy things for us to do is we just uh, load the sample into the demo cell and then we detect if there is new structure coming out, new phase coming out at high pressure. And then we go to the furnaces and then we make the new phase. Yes, we do the new material synthesis. But we always study from the like some materials, we think it's already not very stable. We think, oh, you know, uh, some phase transition. Let's just see. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That was the next question. Um, my second question is what makes like what makes the compound a good uh, candidate for high pressure? Uh, I guess right now. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I just yeah. we just we don't know. To be honest, this is all the makeup story after I made the new material. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so I just fill it and then I go back write the story. And yeah, so I like to share how I feel with you guys. So I said, oh, you can think of this, but I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I have one. I have an answer to that. Um, so, you know, uh, the way we was talking about how you can play around with one column, like calcium, strontium, barium, you know, and replace and change the uh, unit cell size. Sometimes the small one won't, it just doesn't form. But maybe you can force it by putting these elements together under pressure and trying to. You know, basically force the unit cell to form. And it happens. That's one reason. Okay, we better move on. So thank you, Wayland.